Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us this morning. My name is Catherine Quigley, and I'm the education coordinator here at Hardburger Park. I'm here with Julia Bird of the Native Prairies Association of Texas, and she's here um, to explain the Savannah ecotone and the um, processes that maintain it. So I'll turn it over to her here. All right, Julia, the floor is yours. Hi, everybody. How are y'all doing this morning? Okay, so um, first of all, you're like, what is a savanna ecotone? And basically, if you think of when, like, say, if you're a painter and there's different gradients between colors, you look at in West Texas, we have our deserts, and then we have the coastal plains, you know, so it's basically the combination, if you can think of. So, so your savanna ecotone is essentially going to be a cross between like a desert-like landscape and the coastal uh, plains or grasslands. So you're going to find a lot of, if you look, you go this direction over here, you'll see like clumps of trees and then you'll see this floss of grassland or, you know, and if you look in here, you can see there's other stuff in here as well that's not just grass. You have your frost weed over here that's blooming, that white flowered thing. Um, that is actually named frost weed because when we have a freeze, it'll actually look like ice will be coming out of the, uh, the bottom of it. And so it's a very ephemeral type of thing. You have to go out really early in the morning, you'll see it. But it's a host plant for butterflies, so it's good stuff. But um, let's get back on savanna ecotone. Essentially, it's just a cross between your desert and your plains or your grasslands, and it has a lot of diversity in it. So even when you look in the clumps of trees, you know that you have. It's typically in this part of Texas would be considered the post oak savanna because your predominant tree is your um, post oak. Comments here. I'm not seeing any comments yet. So, um, if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to post those because Julia has this thread open right here on her phone, so yeah. she'll be able to follow along and answer any questions that you may have. Okay. But uh, what you have here is essentially a post oak savanna, is what, what's going to be for this part of Texas. And so predominant tree obviously will be post oak, and then you also have your blackjack oak, which you typically find in more um, moist areas. I typically find it in places where there's like a dry creek bed, you know, where there's like more, you know, there's more water in that area. And, uh, but, uh, but as you can see today, there's a lot of, I've seen a lot of flowering things. This is kind of the time of year as we get cooler and we get more rain. Everything just has its moment. So the grasses are blooming. And when I see the grasses are blooming, they have their seeds. So you see little tufts of seeds that come at the top, so you have something like this. This would be considered the grass worm, right here. And essentially, when you think of the bloom, it's just a way for the, for the plant to propagate itself. It's the, it's the seed. So you have like an apple tree, Apple is going to be the seed of the apple of that tree. Yeah. Remember that is enough? We're hearing it's a little quiet. Okay. So I'm just gonna move that's gonna be close, but I'm gonna Okay. Kind of I will speak louder. Okay. Okay, so show and landscape lighting. So I'm sorry we can't show in landscape. That's something that Facebook Live does not allow, unfortunately. Okay. okay. Do we want to go over here? Okay. So can you hear me better now? I guess so. All right. So we're going to kind of go um, this little pathway down here and check it out. 
Okay. So as you see here, we see some flowering things. This is your mealy blue sage. You see the beautiful purple blue um, blossoms on it. And then you also have your solanum here, which is uh, has, when you look under the scope, the microscope, you'll see uh, stellate or star-shaped hairs. And as you look, you'll see these yellow fruits over here. And that's how you can also identify plants is by their fruits. And as you go along here, as you go along here, you'll go along into croton. Here's croton right here. This typically shows up in places where you've had disturbance of the soil. So if you've had any sort of um, any disturbance of the topsoil, this is where you will find a lot of croton. It's very aromatic, but it's kind of weedy. It just means that there's definitely some more uh, work to be done as far as getting more uh, uh, grasses in there because it's kind of a weedy invasive thing. Okay, so, all right, hopefully we can get a better idea. Okay, so maybe right over here. All right, so let me show you guys um, what I'm talking about, like when you talk about savanna ecotone with your groupings of trees. The, uh, the, the name of the plant with the yellow fruit, um, it's going to be, a, it's Solanum, S-O-L-A-N-U-M. Um, and yes, Norma, uh, this area of the park, it is open, it is open to the public, you can walk around. Um, there's actually a lovely little trail that we're kind of off trail right now, but I wanted to show you guys, so you see this grouping of trees in front of us. So this is some Texas persimmon. Fruits are actually edible and there may actually be some fruits on this. Let me see. This is the time of year that you have fruits, or fruit on it rather. It's a really, really dark, it's almost like a red, bla blackish color to it. The birds like to eat it, so I typically keep it for the birds. But as you look in the base of this grouping of this, this group of persimmons here, you notice that there's this cat's briar, which is Smil Smilax bonanox. And it's actually an edible plant. And it's kind of this very thorny stuff here, right here. And it is one of the things that you'll see is one of the things that you'll see um, in these areas. You see there's a lot of uh, vegetation that typically grows to the base of the trees. And even if you look where that Smilex bonanox is, there's cow itch. You see the little thing that has the down here? Right. There's some cow itch, right? I wish I had like a stick or something. <laughs> So where I'm pointing here, this plant right here is cow itch. And so you see just in this area, you have this a little more, there's, this is another vining twining plant right here. That's in the milkweed family. And so you have a lot of potential for diversity in here because it acts as a haven or a, uh, protected area. It acts as a protected area for these little tiny plants. And I think I see some other stuff on the other side. Yes, 
um, cow itch is a vine and it can be a little bit, uh, why it's called cow itch, uh, I think it had to do with the cows would like scratch against it or it was something to do with the leaves because they can, they can result in, um, you know, uh, uh, irritation of the skin if you touch the leaves. So, and then on the other side of this area, you see there's, this looks like, aha, okay. So you have, this looks like either a forestria, an elbow bush, but it looks like, could be something else. And of course you have your little baby post oak here. Your little baby post oak. And you got your little baby cedars. And there's a lot of like, you also will notice, there's a lot of little smaller plants that are in here, at the base of these trees. And because a lot of your Texas natives are going to be smaller in size. What part of Smilex is edible? Um, the leaves, they have very tiny leaves. They have like the stem. Um, there's a couple really good books uh, that you can get. Uh, there's one with the guy, um, Edible Plants of Texas. And he actually, it was a, it's a local author and he wrote a um, basically two books and he was talking about how to prepare and how to identify. He has full color photographs in the book. It's, it's a really great book. I don't remember the author's name, but it's Edible Plants of Texas is the name. And there's two books that he wrote, full color photographs. It may be through Texas A&M Press, I'm not sure, but it's, it's a local author. So, but uh, let's go into the grassy areas. Oh, and someone asked, how do I tell the difference between Black Lane Prairie and Post Oak Savannah? That's a good question. Okay, so Black Lane Prairie is going to have different oak trees. You'll still, you still maybe see post oaks, but it also has a different soil type as well. So you have to look, so Black Lane Prairie will have your black clay. You won't have the rocky stuff that you encounter with, um, they say the post oak savanna. And, but it's, it's based, a lot of the grasses are the same. And a lot, but there's a few differences as far as you'll see some grass species in the Blackland Prairie. And uh, is that a brain fart? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, but it, essentially, the main difference between um, your post oak savanna and your Blackland Prairie is your soil, and then you're going to have different plants in there. and because you have different soil, obviously different plants. That's the main difference. And then the black land prairie is closer to the coastal plains. So you look at the geography of it as well. So it's gonna be closer to the coast. So slightly different weather patterns as well going on. So that's the, those are the main differences between those two. Let's see if anyone else has a question here. Um, okay. You know, on the persimmon, I feel like as it gets older, it gets a little more crusty looking, if that's its appropriate word. Um, but that is just kind of what I found to be the natural habit of the persimmons, is for it to get kind of that rough hewn, crusty bark look to it. And they can live quite a long time, too. All right. Okay. All right, and Charles, the name of the plant with the yellow fruit, it's going to be, it's a Solanum, S-O-L-A-N-U-M. It's probably Solanum elignonfolium. I'm not sure what the common name is, but it has a really pretty purple flower on it. And it's already gone through its flowering period. So all you're gonna see now is a yellow fruit that really kind of, uh, very autumnal type of yellowish tone to it. So, okay, let's continue. Let's go to the grassland area. All 
Alrighty, so, so after you look at these little groupings of trees in your savanna ecotone, you're going to find your grassy areas. So you're going to see groups of trees, then this vast swaths of grassland. And if you look here, I like to around, you'll see it looks like it's mostly grassland. And there's a couple of things blooming right now. You have your yellow Indian grass, which is right over here. Uh, it's actually right here, I'll show you. And you have this Indian grass. And you get closer to this. See how the, the details of this, this is why when people try to identify grasses, it, it can be quite difficult because there's such small differences between the species. I mean, you can look at the leaf here, you see how it has a kind of a blue, kind of a certain hue to it. And that's one way you can identify it. But the best way is when it blooms. Okay, should we go along the pathway? Okay. Okay, see if anybody else has got any questions. If you have any questions, go ahead and post those. We're going to work our way back to the, the pathway here. Okay, so someone's asking. They're asking about, yes, uh, April, April Thomason. Solanum is in the nightshade family. Actually, the nightshade family is the potato family. So you have your, your uh, peppers are in, are in the sol solanum family. So like your chili patine or chili patine is the pepper and it's in that family. Your tomatoes are in the same family too. Okay, so Norma's asking about the soil characteristics of the savanna again. Basically, the savanna, so we're right here in the Antonio area, maybe not as rocky, but it's going to have more of a, what's the word I'm looking for here? The, so like Blackland Prairie has your black clay, then you have for your savanna ecotone, it's going to be a different pH to the soil compared to your, so it's going to err on the side of more alkaline. And like in the hill country, which is also a savanna ecotone, you're going to have, it's really, really rocky, very much caliche. Down as you go into San Antonio area, not so much because you're going into South Texas sandy soil. So it's transitioning into that. So that's kind of the general, um, characteristics of soil for the savanna. Um, somebody's asking about animal life. Okay, so for your animal life, you have a couple different tiers. You have your uh, apex predators, which a lot of the apex predators are no longer here. You used to have wolves in central Texas or in this part of the world. Um, you still have bobcats and mountain lions and um, foxes uh, are, I guess they would be considered an apex predator. Yeah, and what else? So you have those guys. And then of course, when you have open fields like this, you're going to have your mice, your field mice. You're also gonna have, there's a Texas native rat that is in the areas like this. Um, in areas, savanna, where you have uh, there's more rock. You might have what we call, I call them digger bees, but they're basically a native species of bee that actually has their, uh, has their home they, in their little rocky little enclaves. So they'll actually have their hive underground. So 
so you've got, and of course you have your pollinators, you have your, so you have your different uh, butterflies that will come through that will have their host plants, like on the frost weed. Um, so we've covered apex predators. Okay, you've got the ones that things they eat. Um, you have your, your birds, so you have like your owls, you have our screech owls, we have a great horned owl here. Um, trying to think of else, there's burrowing owls in certain places, South Texas mainly, but um, what else? Um, hawks, like red tail hawks would work. And what else? I'm trying to think there's hawks, there's uh, your kites. Um, and then we do have South Texas bald eagles, which are not very common. So, but um, that's the general animals that you see. So if you can imagine any animal that is with a, so you have your owl or your, or your hawk that is up in the tree and he's looking at the vast field. Then you start to see where you have hawks are hunting together, hunting together, and they go and they get themselves a few field mice or whatever else. So that's the kind of stuff that you would run into with the Savannah Eco Town. Okay, let's see if there's any other questions here. All right. All right, let's keep going. We're gonna go down this pathway here. Now, as you can see today, we have a lot of people enjoying this lovely weather. So as you go along, you're walking in a park like this. Um, so I wanted I wanted to mention, you know, whenever you which way you want to go. Okay, let's go this way. So whenever you're you're you know you want to be out in nature, and you want to include you know have everybody in the family, there's a couple of things you just need to be aware of. Um, you obviously you want to prepare. So you want to make sure that you have bug spray on and sunscreen and have a good hat and then wear long pants with socks that go up to your like mid cap. And the trick is what you do is you spray your, your socks all the way up to the, like the very, you know, the top of the sock with your bug spray and you spray your shoes especially if you're going in places where it's the sticks. Here, not so much. You have nice open walkway here. So you can wear like what I'm wearing, which is very, <laughs> you know, strolling along type of thing. Um, but you also obviously want to hydrate as well. I find that I take like a small little backpack, you know, you can get them at, you know, stores. I don't want to mention particular stores. But you can get little backpacks and you can do um, put your water in there or your anything that has electrolytes in it, sports drink. And if your hat is foldable, that's really great. And uh, take the camera if you want to have your camera, take pictures of stuff. Because this is a good time of year to take pictures of, oh, yes, even, even in decay, if you will. You see there's... This is a type of wheat and how beautiful it is. And even though it's basically past its prime, it's still very beautiful in its decay, if you will. So, but that, if you're going out with your family, just know where you're going, tell people where you're going and Make sure you pack everything that you need. And sometimes the kids can get a little bit restless. This makes you have a contingency plan in case they go, yeah, I don't want to do this anymore. <laughs> I don't want to leave. So, all right, let's see what we have. All right. Yeah, you're welcome, Norma. Um, no, I learned that, that trick about spraying bug spray on their socks because I used to many many moons ago I did a um, I was a research uh, assistant if you will for the Weston Ranch for doing a flora which basically means you're going out and you're
collecting plants and you're going out in the field. And so we learned that very quickly that if you don't want to have chiggers or the possibility of ticks and other fun things, um, that really helped a lot because if you're walking in super tall grass, as you see, like we would walk in fields like this, looking for plants to collect, <laughs> you need to be protected. So now it's kind of hard to see on Facebook Live, but there's also, you have some really lovely grass blooming right now. Oh, what kind of yucca? Ah, you saw it. Okay, so the yucca is going to be, where is it? Is that yucca? There's one over here. I see. I see some more yucca here. Um, this could either be uh, yucca chapuliana, which they get really, really super, super tall. And you can see they kind of are in like groupings. So you have one and then you have a couple other little babies. That one right there. Yes, beautiful. And th there's also, and I believe Draculiana may be the same as Spanish dagger. Because you look at the, the edges of it and it actually looks like a dagger. the curling on these leaves. So I'm fairly sure this is probably the Yucca Chiculiana. Yeah, yeah, chiggers are everywhere. <laughs> they are a pain in the neck. Um, okay, so what else do I see here? There's Hmm. Let's continue on the path. <laughs> okay, so if you look in here, we have another um, grass that is really cool. It's called Sidoats Grandma. It's actually state grass in Texas. And it's a it's a good grass to have um, as far as you know, if you're trying to do um, conservation efforts, you want to see that in your grassland that you're working with. Is one of the big four. And it's just a really pretty little thing, too. I mean, you just, it's so delicate looking. All right, anybody else got questions? Um, Lyme disease, I've not heard of any issues with Lyme disease. Um, yeah, I, I haven't heard of any issues with Lyme disease here. I think that's just kind of, I just said it's more of an Eastern problem. Okay. Oh, I see some more stuff. Okay, so we have some other pretty things here. So as you're walking along, you see some... This is um, in the Malvaceous family right here. And that has a really pretty orange flower on it. And that's another one that um, in the Malvaceous family is also the family for the hibiscus. So like, you know, your, your gardeners out there, um, hibiscus is in the same family. And actually there's the orange blossoms here. They closed up, but they're typically open during the mornings. And I've seen a lot of, I've seen a lot of your sulfurs, your, your white butterflies on these, especially if they're running out of places to get nectar. If these guys are blooming, they're all over them. have a milkweed. This is Metelia right here. You do not want to touch the leaves. You kind of want to 
give it a, because the leaves are um, milkweed. You have the milky sap will irritate your skin, but this is a, this is a milkweed right here. And there's a couple, you even see the desiccated seed thing right here. It looks like a weird pickle. <laughs> the way that I like to describe it. It's a really funky looking pickle. I know. Okay. All right. So we look here and we have ourselves a hackberry. Oh, oh, this is really cool. This is something cool. So I think this is a Hercules club. So this right here has really nasty little thorns on it. This is its, it's common name is a toothache tree. And what the Indians would do is they would actually like chew it because it would actually numb the, you know, so if you had a toothache, it would numb your toothache. And then in the same area, you have your hackberry. So this is probably a sugar leaf hackberry. What was the pickle? Um, the pickle was the, the fruits of the metelia, the vining twining thing, often looked to me like a really funky looking pickle. And then when they open up, uh, they're, because they're actually like a bright green color too. They're very funky looking pickle. That's what I call them. <laughs> oh, okay. So the previous plant, the milkweed, um, the monarchs, what the monarchs go after is not, I've never seen them go after this milkweed vine, but they have the milkweed plant, which is grows more in your, um, grassland areas and it's typically in short grass prairies because you have your short grass prairies your grasses only grow to be maybe two feet tall versus like six to seven in the other types which they're really really tall grass um, but the monarchs don't I've never seen them go after that milkweed so but um, here we have uh, we've got a snapdragon vine. And this is just, you see these tiny, tiny little fruits, very delicate little heart shaped leaves. And this is a very, it actually looks like a little miniature snapdragon when it's blooming. It typically blooms in the spring. And these are your seeds. And you can just crush them, they should be tiny little things. See. No, that one didn't have anything in it. Let's see. The other thing too is when you're out and about in nature, unless you know that that plant is not just tiny, tiny little seeds in there. Unless you know that plant is not going to cause some serious dermatitis or it's not poisonous. <laughs> because we do have some plants in Texas that will kill you if you touch them. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> know your plants, at least have an idea before you go or carry a guidebook with you. Wildflowers of Texas, pretty easily found, is a good one. Has full color photographs, even goes by flower color. Um, great for taking along with you and it's pretty compact. I think a lot of these are just spent, so. But, uh, but yeah, but here you have the remnants of the snapdragon vine and you can find this at commercial nurseries during the springtime. You even find it, uh, Lady Bird Johnson when they have their, their plant sale, which I think was going to happen here recently or just happened. And they're tiny little plants when you get them, but give them about three years in the ground and they're good in your own landscape. But, uh, okay. Let's see what other goodies we find here. Okay, so we're coming up, we are talking about inevitably, inevitably in savannas, because we've had all this development, you're going to run into um, invasive plants. 
And sometimes a plant is invasive simply because it has room to grow. Not because, like for example, this is a Bacris, Bacris neglecta. Poverty weed um, is also called, what was the other one? It has many, many Roosevelt's, I think Roosevelt something. It's got many names to it. And uh, this can become weedy. It is, it, is a, it is a native, but because you have disturbance of the top layer of soil, this will take over an area. And once it takes over an area, it's just impossible, almost impossible to get rid of without cutting it down and spraying some sort of herbicide on it. Um, so this is an example of where, where the opportunity strikes, plant takes over. Then there are instances where the plant is just straight up just introduced by humans who thought they were really pretty plants, put them in the garden and they escaped out of cultivation, uh, which I haven't seen any yet. But yeah, this is one of the more technically invasive, but not only if it's allowed to take over, if you will. Okay. And we have, oh, we have our agarita here. This is your uh, agarita. And this actually has a lovely uh, yellow blossom in the spring. Okay, cool. So the wildflower center plant sale is until end of November. Okay, that is good to know. Um, but this actually gets red berries on it and these red berries are edible. People have made those berries into um, a jam or a deli. They're very, they have a lot of seeds in them, but they're very delicious. <laughs> I've had a few, <laughs> but uh, they can get quite big. Um, and a lot of people will take them out of their landscapes or their property. And they're just, they're just a good plant. They're in their holly family too. You see, it looks very much like a holly. It's one of the, one of two species of uh, holly in this area. There's another um, Central Texas agarita that is actually, I believe it is a threatened species at this moment and very, very hard to find. Let's see. The Wildflower Center is in Austin. It's Lady Bird Johnson. It's the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center. It's something that she started. It's on like 25 acres, I believe. And they're just, uh, it's an agarita, A-G-A-R-I-T-I, -I, or A, excuse me, an agarita. Yeah, okay. Let's see if we can find some uh, mythical. That would be cool. Okay. Oh, okay. Another way you can tell or identify trees as you're walking along is you can look at the bark of the tree. So obviously this is a persimmon here. It's gonna have this really crusty, kind of hard worn look here. Um, this is your persimmon. And then you come over here and you have your cedar elm. And you look to see, it has this lovely kind of just rough hewn. You have your lichens here, there's different lichens. There's one here. This is a lichen. There's actually several different species of lichens here. There are people who actually study the lichens and they look to see what is prevalent. And lichens are kind of like a, um, I wouldn't say an indicator, but they tell you kind of the health of a system. If you, if you have a good variety of lichens and they're, you know, abundant, you've got a fairly healthy system here. And then of course we all know cedar tree, which is very can make your skin itch with the sap right here. All right, let's see what this is. Right here. 
uh, coarse texture, are they harmful to the trees? No, lichens are not harmful to the trees. They're actually, they are, they're good. They're good plants to have. Or I wouldn't say plants, but they're good, good things to have on the tree. find anything else. Oh, okay. So we have some holes in the ground here. So you may run into this. See right here. You may run into this as you're out and about. Just give them some room. It's probably a small little mammal. Could be a raccoon, maybe a uh, armadillo. Could be, you know, any, any number of small mammals that are like, hey, good little burrow in there. Um, but that's a good sign to see that little burrow like that. Okay. Any questions? Right. What time are we getting to? Nine forty-one. Oh, nine forty-one. Does anybody, does anybody else have some pressing questions or? Oh, yes. Okay. So we were in that sunny, sunny area, grassy area, and you look under here, and it's a whole different world. So as you look around, you start to see different plants in here. Agarita grows about anywhere, but you typically find it underneath trees in areas like this. Okay, oaks have mossy like balls. Okay, so that is your ball, your ball moss. Um, they're not harmful. They're not harmful. Uh, Santa, Hampton, um, the ball moss is not harmful to the trees. Now you will find it typically on trees that have issues, who have disease or they're not doing great. So this is why I think some people will associate them with being harmful when they're not. So. Uh, mm. well, uh, Norma just asked, what are the COVID rules for walking at Phil Hardberger Park? Um, mask required number of people. So um, Masks are, we definitely require some social distancing, make sure you give lots of space between you and among other people. Um, the, as far as I know, um, masks are not required, but recommended. Number of people um, that I'm not confident on the specific number on. Um, of course, the fewer people, the better, so mm -hmm. that we can reduce the risk of um, infection. Okay, and Martha, Martha Lynn Seville asks, other examples of post oak savanna, places to visit? Okay, I would say you could go to, we have some great Texas state parks and um, anywhere within central Texas area. So you're talking about Enchanted Rock um, could be, it may be a transition zone between the West Texas because it's kind of yeah, Chanted Rock, um, really any place in like central Texas, uh, the, uh, there's some Texas state parks in that area. There, I think there's a Blanco State Park. Um, I'm trying to think, is there any other? Oh, um, you could also visit the Wildfire Center in Austin. Um, they have a good example and, it, and you'll you'll see if you visit there you'll see a difference in how like say you visit here it's a little more scrubby a little bit more you know looks more like a grass thing you go up to um like say the wildflower center and you'll still see a lot of the same you know the clumpings of trees and then you'll see this vast swaths of grassland but there's slightly different plants there you'll see more <clears throat> you'll see more milkweeds um Okay. Yes, thank you. Thank you, April. Yes, it is an epiphyte, not a parasite. Um, 
So I would say on the ball moss, um, you could take the the dead and dying limbs off, um, but I you wouldn't need to treat it like spray anything on it or anything. I I just just remove the branches and you can compost them or have them for you know a fire or whatever whatever works. But yeah, that's totally normal on those. <clears throat> Excuse me, on the uh, for ball moss to do that. Okay, so more this way. And sometimes when you're walking through these areas, you'll see smaller trees growing underneath these larger trees. So these little clumpings of tree that you see, these, these areas um, are really important, not just for your small little like flowering things, are also important for your smaller trees and shrubs. Um, and you can see how it's just really reaching for light, a lot of these, very kind of like leaning one way or the other. Um, like there's a Mexican plum that has, it's, a, it's the earliest, uh, it blooms the earliest and it has a really pretty white flowers. It looks like a, if you've ever grown a peach or a plum tree, has the white flowers with a tiny little, little anthers in there, just really beautiful, very fragrant. And it only really grows beneath oak trees or beneath larger trees like this. So like in here, you see there's more hackberry. Um, you also, it looks like you've got, Oh yes, yeah, some bird's nest under here too. I see a bird nest over here. We're gonna have to crawl over there. Let's run over here. Okay. You see the remnants of the bird nest right up there. So these are very important, not just for the plants, they're important for your, your birds and your small mammals and for your deer that eat all your yard. <laughs> they leave their babies in here in protected areas. Awesome. Yes. Okay. Down on the on the ground here, when you look under the oak trees, you see there's different types of grasses that grow under the oak or under shade. So you have this stuff here, which is probably some sort of sedge, S-E-D-G-E, -E, and it likes these kind of semi-shaded areas where it can either be super dry or it can be super moist. It kind of grows everywhere. Um, pretty adaptable. Um, you also have things like inland sea oats that you see on, uh, that you see near uh, creek creeks and springs, and it also grows in like dry areas like this. And you can also get that from. I'm not sure what type of, like what bird that was exactly, but that was some sort of bird nest. Okay. Okay. Right, so 
anyone else has got some questions here. So as we're talking about your savannas, one of the questions that may come up is like, well, if you have an area that you want to restore, how do you go about doing it? What are the myriad of ways? Oh, oh, look, here's something. Here. Now this is, oh, but this, I'm actually not sure what this is, but this is another thing that's a really cool little thing. You see, it's got the, here. I don't see very many of these in my neck of the woods where I, because I'm based um, out of New Braunfels, but I think it's definitely in the Fabaceae family. So it means it has a bean as a, as a seed. And you look at the, the leaves, you typically have more of a kind of the shape that you see. You see kind of like a that formation. It should have fruit on it at some point. I wonder if this is about to bloom. Hmm, looks like it. But um, anyway, okay, so if you're wanting to restore, say you have remnants of a savanna on your property, or you have, um, you're helping to do restoration work, um, you want to make you want to make sure you know what's there first. So you look at, you know, maybe doing, bringing in, say, uh, U.S. Fish and Game or whoever, you know, would know or bring in some, um, like for the university. You know, the Western Ranch brought in uh, some research assistants. We went out there and we collected plants and identified them and all that fun stuff. Um, so you want to know what you got there, then. You want to see what are your invasives? What are you dealing with? What are your issues? So if you're dealing with a lot of Johnson grass, are you dealing with Bermuda grass, <laughs> which is entirely possible? Um, you know, what are strategies that you can, you know, are you close to an urban population? Are you out in the sticks? Are you out in the country? If you're close to an urban population, um, one of the best ways if you want to get rid of like, if you've got just a whole field of Bermuda or Johnson grass or whatever it is, is to just put down, and this isn't small scale, mind you, put down some black plastic during the middle of the summer and it will cook anything that's below. And that's something you can do on a small scale. And that basically gives you a clean slate. So you do that through the summer, like say, or even like late spring, so May, June, July, August, rip it up, black plastic, and you have a clean slate. You can cast out seed, um, but just know that if you like get a seed mixture for your area, which you can go on Native American seed, there's also King seed in South Texas. Um, they actually have seed mixtures that are specific for different areas. So for here, I'm not sure what they would call it, maybe a Comanche mix, but look on the website. They usually give you a lot of information. You'll be able to figure it out. Um, so you can cast out seed and we have more questions. Mm. Is that the American Beauty Berry? Um, um, the one that I just showed you? Um. Uh, Santa, can you clarify which berry you're referring to? Sorry, we just saw your comment now. And Pamela Wilson said, evergreen sumac. Thank you, Pamela. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I don't see it very often, so that's why I was like, whoa, what is this? <laughs> um, uh, Santa, um, Santa said yes, so she's going to clarify the berry for us. American Beauty Berry. Yeah, the American Beauty Berry is going to have like a pink, um, kind of a reddish pink fruit on it. And it's going to be a little more lower to the ground. Um, it's typically, it, it can get big, but it's, it typically is more, when you see it, it's maybe about yang tall. It's not super big. Sometimes you see it like this tall, but that's because 
somebody's watering it. Somebody's giving it consistent, you know, consistent water. Um, okay. So, but as you do your trying to make the savanna or trying to restore the savanna, um, once you pull that black plastic up, you basically have a clean slate. You can do, you can cast seeds on it. She says the last branch, berries start out greenish. Yeah, so you start out green and then they kind of turn into kind of that pinky, pinky red. The last branch berries. Before the evergreen sumac? Was it? Oh, are you talking about this right here? Right there. Is that what you're talking about? Right there? These are kind of, these look like either little baby flowers or the fruit coming out here. Yes, that's what she was talking about. Yeah, I think that's just, this is the, um, Pamela was the one to identify. This is an evergreen sumac. The American beauty berry will have larger, you see how the leaves are kind of short like this. The American beauty berry have longer branches and their, their leaves are a little bit longer too. They're kind of, they're really similar though. They're very fern looking, fern like, if you will, in their construction. Cat Anna Marie D says beauty berries a bright purple when ripe. Yeah. It's an understory tree and usually found in the wild where yes. there is water source with good drainage. Yes, and and cat, um, you can find in um, your commercialized nurseries, uh, you can actually find there's a white American beauty berry, which is kind of hard to find, but they they kind of been messing with the the you know, but. Um, <laughs> Yeah, okay. Um, shall we continue? Yes. Uh, we've got three minutes. Okay. All right, guys, we've got three minutes left. Do you have any more pressing questions or? What's the best way to go here? Just keep going around? Okay. <laughs> But um, the uh, Ninga Prairie Association of Texas, we have a San Antonio chapter and we have our monthly meetings and they're now on Zoom, obviously, with things. And they're the first Tuesday of every month. And so if you're interested in this kind of stuff, uh, we have speakers like uh, this month, actually this past week, we had a guy that was talking about how he was using drones to help in conservation efforts. Yeah, it's really cool. Oh. And he was helping scientists with their, I think we can turn it on, don't we? Um, yeah. Oh, we have a pine tree. Or no, what? No, no, I bet you this is a sumac. Yeah, I think this is a sumac here. But, uh, but the Native Prairie Association of Texas, we also have our volunteer opportunities. Um, the Kirchhoff Family Farm is one of the main ones. We also have uh, the Creech, C-R-E-E-C-H, um, which is a, another prairie that's just down the road from the Kirchhoff Family Farm. And there are opportunities to volunteer and actually do conservation work. Um, you know, so getting hot and sweaty, getting out there and taking lots of allergy medication if you're allergic to grass, <laughs> you know, whatever works. Um, but every month we have our meetings and uh, just talking about different things in conservation. So, all right, but uh, one minute. So we have one minute left, folks. <laughs> Any burning questions? Okay, all right. Um, what else say? And of course, um, if you want to just be out in nature and enjoy, you know, be in this the Savannah Ecotone or any other, Texas uh, Parks and Wildlife has really great website and good stuff. Of course, you have Phil Hardberger Park. You have a lot of really great parks here in San Antonio. 
Um, not too familiar with what they all are, but I know there's a lot of really great parks here. And, well. Norma says, thanks so much for this presentation. Very informative. Well, you're welcome, so Norma. And Santa. Yeah. And Santa. And Santa. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, thank you so much for joining us um, this morning. Um, please stay tuned. We have weekly presentations through Phil Hardberger Park and there's just great, uh, more great content coming, coming at you. So stay tuned. Um, our website updates as does our Facebook page. So thanks very much, everyone. Oh, and Pat Marie, Pat and Marie, if you can post a volunteer information um, Kat, if you look on uh, the Native Prairie Association, look on, uh, search on um, Facebook on the Native Prairie Association of Texas, San Antonio chapter, it, it'll come up as SANPAT, S-A-N-P-A-T. And we will always have notifications on the page. You can also sign up to get notifications through our actual, um, we have a, I think it's MailChimp or something. We send out notifications um, before our any of our work days. So our next work day is actually, we have one today at the Kirchhoff Family Farm. And it's a continuation of a work day that we had last Saturday. And it was basically planting um, some natives for a fire break um, at the, along a fence line. Um, and then he's got Mr. Kirchhoff. There's another, the next Saturday, the 17th, we have a work day that's going to be occurring and it's basically more conservation stuff taking out invasives um we'll probably be doing there's any a sundry things there's always something to do with the conservation efforts but um if you go to the facebook page you can sign up for notifications there norma wonders can you post that website in the comments yeah definitely so uh, i see if i can enter away I don't know if you can now. It definitely can after. Okay. All right. Thanks again, everybody. We appreciate okay. having you here. Yes. I'll have a wonderful day. <laughs>